Hey there, everybody. Welcome to this session here. I have Joseph Allman with me. He's in the boot camp over at Game Art Institute, and uh, I am hosting this. You are looking at his screen, and we are going to have a bit of a conversation about Substance Designer, which is one of the biggest force multipliers out there. Forgetting your name, your 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 work out in front of recruiters and and the people that kind of make these decisions. It's not the biggest part of Algorithmic's uh, product line. Substance Painter is the biggest one, but Substance Designer is kind of like the heart. So when you get into this program, you're really getting into the heart of Algorithmic and the heart of people who are really uh, diving into this and, and learning this and are part of this kind of material revolution that's happening. So, Joseph, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. So this is really amazing. You know, I told you this in class. I, I think I told almost everybody s sitting here watching this live that, you know, this is just an incredibly developed piece. So I know you say you're not in the game industry right now, but, you know, yeah, it's just, yeah. just a matter of time. So walk me through your thinking process here, because if, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the most important things here is your thinking process, because that's your development process. So walk me through that. How do you start tackling a project like this where you're going to have um, in fact, maybe what you could do is like, what, what are the elements? What's the complexity? Like how many different levels of design and dirt and all of that did you actually have to put into this? Cause I'm looking at that chart and that graph and it's, uh, it's pretty intense. My, my workflows, I really try to start with the basic shapes yeah. at first and try to keep everything together. And it's, definitely makes it way easier once you start putting the boxes around stuff and labeling things it makes it way easier and much more straightforward as far as putting your materials together and layering mm. them yeah um but yeah that's usually where i started the basic shapes okay so what are the basic shapes here is it just the tiles i usually start off with getting reference so put up some broken tile reference so i had people Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this one's really good. Mm -hmm. But just I try to find this is this is kind of cool too. Um, I would rather go a different way with my grout. This one as well. I try to see what what's there in the shapes mm -hmm. and how how to block out just the big shapes at first. So obviously the biggest shape are the tiles themselves. Yeah. And then after that you have, if I'm going to do cracks or this is why I said reference is important because you got to know what you're going to do before you try and do it. So if I'm going for these cracked tiles, then I'm going to try and figure out, okay, how do I make these little one-off shapes and also, you know, you notice the pattern between them. You notice that this crack doesn't go over to this tile or, you know, they don't continue over. So you see, you notice the small, subtle things about it that make it look real. Yeah. Realistic. Which, and I'll show you. You know, if you don't mind, because I know beginners, at least when I first started opening up Substance, I was like, what? do I do? So if you go back to that new, okay. um, you know, you did, you did something specific. So new substance, and then just stop right there because there's physical based metal roughness, specular glossy, you, you know, all of these different things. So which one did you choose? Which one do you use? So I, I tend to uh, think towards uh, working in Unreal. Yeah. So I always go for the physically based metallic and roughness. Okay. Since in my experience, it's always worked decently well in Unreal. Okay, and I understand. And it isn't too hard to add new outputs if you need them anyway. So, but it's a good place for me to start. Okay, got it. All right, so you do that. You're starting a, a new graph. It's going to be uh, met metallic roughness. And once you do that, it's going to create, you know, the foundational nodes for you. Yeah. Do you worry about the width and height at all or no? Um, I tend to stay above 1024. I mean, 
every now and again, I will knock it down to 512 just to see what it looks like for mm -hmm. like, you know, for shits and giggles. Yeah. <laughs> but I almost never plan on using it that low. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I usually start around 1024. Um, these modes, these two right here, where it says relative to parent, which I learned that uh, if you submit anything to the uh, substance share website, these need to be relative to parent and not absolute. Got it. Um, but yeah, that's what I start out with. Okay. And I almost always, for every material I, I create, because that preset doesn't add a uh, ambient occlusion channel, it mm -hmm. only has the uh, base color, normal, roughness, metallic, and height, I almost always go in and add in another output for uh, for uh, ambient occlusion okay and the way you do that this is a brand new output with no settings on it whatsoever um well it's good to name them because then you know you know what you're working with as far as i know the identifier is uh only internal to a uh, substance you don't actually see it the label is what you actually see so in there, and then the group is material. Uh, and then what you want to do, sorry, come over here, add an item. In this case, we need an ambient occlusion. RGB is fine. And there you go. Sweet. So that's usually what I start out with, is and because ambient occlusion, when when you see your material without it, it just it looks super fake. But once you pop on the uh, ambient occlusion, it, it's like nine day. Mm. So starting out, um, you want to put in your tiles. So like I said, I try to start out with the uh, the big shapes first. So obviously the tiles. In my case. And you're just a uh, you're just right clicking or space bar or how are you getting the notes? Oh yeah. So you when you hit the space bar inside of the uh, I don't know what this window is called, the node view, I guess. Yep. Uh, you hit spacebar, it'll bring up a search tab so you can search for any of the channels that are right. over here as well. Yeah, I've Probably noticed that uh, longer. the power users, that's like the main way you very rarely browse, just spacebar and type. Yeah, I, I think it, as you start to get more comfortable with Substance Designer, um, you stop depending on looking, having to look through the list of what's there and you just know, and even if you don't know, you have kind of an idea and you can right. add in a few and see which one works. Um, but yeah, so space bar. So my basic tile is, I use, I use the uh, square. I have 10 by 10, not that that really matters. It depends on whatever you want, mm -hmm. square pattern. And then I set the luminance to random. And what that does is it takes each of those tiles and sets each one's, I don't want to say opacity because I don't think it's the opacity, but just that it's brightness, it varies. It. And I'll show you also why I did that instead of just doing uh, all my tiles in one okay. together. But uh, and then I do an offset random, but it's like a really small value since tiles won't be that far off from each other. Let's see. Like a, Got it. Like a pixel, two pixels off. Not yeah. that much. All right. So next thing I do is I make a detect, an edge detect. And what edge detect does is it takes um, any uh, different points of value and uh, creates an edge around it. So, and here, this is where I set like the, the size of my tile and I can change the edge width here. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why I did this is because in the future, if I would like to change this, change the size of my grab or the size of my tiles, I can have it done procedurally and 
have a control for it to change at the end that will affect anything that's using it. Yeah. Um, that, that's why you set the different color values. So Yeah, exactly. Got it. All right. So it would be able to catch all the different boxes. That yeah. That strikes me as that's one of those things where it's like, you know, they created this universe for us to play in, but you wouldn't necessarily think that logically. Like that's not something that linearly you'd follow. It's more like somebody played, found that, and then that's just become the workflow. Yeah, exactly. How did you discover that? Um, I actually discovered it from another tutorial that I uh -huh. saw. It yeah. was for, um, oh man, I think it was for like a, a roof tile or something. That's pretty cool. And it, it just dawned on me that it was way, that it was better to do it this way because I ended up needing, I would end up needing this anyways. And I'll show you, there's a couple of things um, I can do with it. So histogram scan, for instance. What a histogram scan does is it, for in this case, taking the input from my tiles here, mm -hmm. is it, create somewhat like a like a mask and I can mask off certain uh, oh. grayscale values yeah and if I set the contrast real high then I can if I bring it down I can control how many tiles I want to work with and this is comes into play when I'm doing my uh, cracks damage dirt dust wh whatever I want to mask that and that way um, if I ever change or if I do a randomize on my uh, tiles, this mask will change along with it, but it's still based on this tile. Wow. That's pretty awesome. I think right there speaks to the power of this program. I know we're just getting started. And oh, yeah. our, our goal here in this video is we're going to look at this process. Or will we have time to get close to the end results you had? You know, I know it took, takes a lot longer, but is there a way that we can? Uh, probably. Uh, I, I did it a few times on my own just to see how fast I could power through it. <laughs> um, I mean, I was able to do it in under an hour, so. Okay, cool. Once you know the process. All right, well yeah, then let's, the, the, I'll, um, I'll interrupt you every now and then, but otherwise let's just uh, speed right ahead. See if we can. All right, cool. Alrighty. So from here, let's go and add in a bevel. And the bevel, essentially what I'm doing, just creating a round edge for my tiles. Mm -hmm. It's just for the shape, getting that rounded edge. Come back here and look at the reference. I Got it. Do that all the time. I just try to find little details that I like. And that tile was very sharp. But this. I just want very slight, you see, like barely at the edge there. Okay, yeah. Then you want to blend that. Oh, that's fascinating. What does that do? How does that change the equation? The, uh, if you see the difference, it kind of just it brings it out a little further and also adds in a little second layer of uh, our second edge mm -hmm. softness. Interesting. It's almost like a Photoshop trick. So you have yeah. the one thing in, you duplicate it, and then, you know. That's exactly like how how it made sense to me is yeah. by um, thinking in terms of like Photoshop and just, cause you can, you can literally do anything you want in here. You can move, move things around just like Photoshop. You just have to have patience and I don't need this just yet. 
All right, and what nodes are you creating? Make sure you tell me as you're doing this. Yep, so I just created a gradient linear one. Um, what I'm gonna do is I just cloned this uh, tile generator. Yeah. And what I'm doing is I'm gonna create like a slight, uh, like a slope for each of the uh, tiles. Okay. But what I don't need though is I don't need elements random. Flip the rotation. Random. Yeah, and all this does is it just helps to create that illusion of depth because that's that's all you're doing and when you're you know when you're making normal maps and textures is you're creating the illusion of detail and depth. Mm -hmm. So this really helps to separate your tiles a little bit more. And then I gotta let's get color. Brighter so it's not as crazy looking. And then create another blend and blend this back on top of itself. Let's do another It doesn't need to be crazy, just it's there. Slight, but it all helps. Mm -hmm. um, so we can get a look of what it, see what it looks like just now. This is a normal map. Uh, I don't know what they call it. Just that they call it normal. Mm -hmm. But you feed a, a height map into it and it creates your normal map from it. So that into the normal. Nice. So we have our tile shape so far. Yeah. And um, just to help me with the uh, visual side of this, and make it not so shiny so I can see. All right. Cool. And if you can see, by putting in the slopes, it, it kind of, it's not like super obvious, but there's like a slight difference between the edges. Mm-hmm of the tiles, so it makes them look even more varied and popping out. Yeah. Yeah, so let's keep going. So after that, um, we're going to do a histogram scan again. And let's throw this back into it. This is what I did already. I just deleted it, just bringing it back again. And then blend. Our base tile, oops, do that all the time. Okay, let's do some tracks. All right, so this also creates somewhat our mask for when the tiles are broken and. Yeah, and you set the blend I mean. mode to subtract, you said, right? Yeah, so okay. blend mode to subtract. So anywhere where it was white, it's going to remove that? Yeah. So the way that subtract works is it just, this is like uh, your mask. It's essentially mm -hmm. a mask. Um, it's taking all the white values from this node and subtracting it out of whatever you throw it on top of. Yeah. In this case, the tile, the, the base tiles. Got it. And my phone is ringing. So like I said, always important. Create your boxes, what are they called here? Frames, frame your stuff up and... You, and you, just, uh, you just select it, the the set and then click... Yeah, so you select everything that you want to put in the box and then oh. you hit the... When you hit it, it creates a frame around it. Okay, and that grows as you move the things around? Um, no, it doesn't grow. So if you want to make it bigger, you have to grab the corner and... Okay. Oh my gosh. What is going on? Okay. Yeah. Got it. That's the way you grow it out. Okay. And um, my word of advice is if you're working in uh, if you're working in substance and you this is like just for like uh, organizational purposes, mm -hmm. um, I try to always keep like the output of whatever a group of nodes are. Like say for instance, this is the base style. So yeah. this is that output of all of these together. So I keep it I try to keep it at the end and, and as close 
to the edge as I can so that I know like it won't be like difficult like to know which one if I have it over here I'm like uh, oh man which one which one do I choose and I have to figure it out but if I already see it vis visibly sticking out it makes it easier to grab it and feed it somewhere so let's go to the next line so this is the base tile um, in my case I went for the uh, cracks next so let's go ahead and create some cracks so the cell three, if you can see, it already gives a somewhat cracky, and I know that's not a word, but. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it. It already gives you somewhat of a cracky look. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't put you too far off from where, our, where you want to be as far as cracks go. Yeah. I mean, all of these are arbitrary, whatever you, you know, whatever you need for your scale or hardness it's up to you yep. um now comes making it look more realistic so do a directional warp yeah uh okay so what i did here and i usually i do this a lot for creating edge damages and mm -hmm. i i'll show you i'll do this again but um what the directional warp does is on its own without being fed any information it doesn't do anything okay at all you have to feed it an intensity input and what it does is it takes you know takes the grayscale information from whatever you feed it and warps oh. warps your uh, image um, the intensity by how bright it is how dark it is or how bright it is man and so i usually do two because the first one is i scale it up so that i'm not getting it's like a slight like variation in moves and pushes them around organically mm -hmm. yeah and that's like the first layer then i go ahead and clone this curling noise again feed the second one this is the second one mm -hmm. now i set the scale higher um all right i love that and that's uh that creates the frequency basically of um exactly. of the detail so you get the big modifications and then you get the smaller jaggy modifications that's awesome exactly. so this one here creates the uh the small little curves mm -hmm. and inside of the cracks yeah. so that it makes it look even more realistic because obviously uh, let's see all right um so again i'll be using this technique again you'll see it, so if, if anything you get anything from this this is definitely a good little uh technique to use yeah i was about to say warps. totally worth the price of admission but this is free so you know this is just awesome all right, so let's keep going. Um, and you know what? Actually, I can invert this because I don't need it to be. Then slope blur, my best friend. Slope blur. Okay, I've heard lots. And you get the slope blur grayscale. Yeah, so if you guys don't know the difference, um, well, I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody would not know the difference between grayscale and color, but in Substance Designer, um, your nodes can either be grayscale or color, but you can't, there's no mixing of them. And um, if you do want to mix them, so say for instance, you have like this red or yellow, I guess in this case, and oh, let's do a blend. Let's say you wanted to blend this yellow in with your cracks mm -hmm. or on top of your cracks or whatever. So We'll feed this in there first, the color into the background, and we'll feed the cracks on top. What happens is, if you see this red line, um, it's not working. It means mm -hmm. it's not working. It means it's not processing. So the reason for that is because this right here, these are all grayscale. So you see that it's gray, gray, gray. When it's orange, it means it's color. And um, in order to 
use this, you have to set it into a gradient. Mm -hmm. This is up here, this little button up here called the gradient map. Yeah. And what that will do is it will essentially remap all of your grayscale information to color. Yeah. And then you can put that on top of your yellow, if that's what you want. But without the gradient map, you won't be able to blend grayscale information and color information. All righty, we'll be done. So, slope blur. Slope blur is similar to the rotation, or sorry, the directional warp in that it helps to create um, to create those like high frequency details. Mm -hmm. um, however, it does it in like a. It's hard to explain. I'll show you right now. When you, you'll see it, it, it'll it'll blow your mind when you see the results. So, I'm gonna get the black and white spots too. And then I'm going to feed that into a blur since I don't want it to be super sharp. Let's put it down. Good. Feed into the slope. So right away, you see it's totally obliterated my cracks. But if I bring the intensity down, right around here, then I'll set the samples up. If you see, it creates all these little cracks and crevices that go around my cracks. Mm. So it creates that a, another illusion of depth. And then you blend that back onto itself. 